जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी बरधारी गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी बरधारी यशोद नंदन भ्रज जान रंजना यशोद नंदन भ्रज जान रंजना या मुन तेरा वन चारी या मुन तेरा वन चारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी बरधारी गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी बरधारी यशोद नंदन भ्रज जान रंजन यशोद नंदन भ्रज जान रंजन यमुन तेरा वन चारी याम न तेरा वन चारी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम 
हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Premanande Haribo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jayamudirayat Nesta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki So we're continuing to do, go through these different prayers offered by Queen Kunti, which is from the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter number 8. Right, so we were hearing Queen Kunti's prayers uh, last night. We stopped at this verse, which is a very well-known verse, very beautiful verse. You can chant, repeat, Krishnaya Vasudevaya Devaki Nandanaya Cha Nanda Gopakumaraya Govindaya Namo Namaha 
So Queen Kunti prays to Lord Krishna, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord who has become the son of Vasudeva, the pleasure of Devaki, the boy of Nanda, and the other cowherd men of Vrindavan, and the enlivener of the cows and the senses. So Queen Kunti describing Lord Krishna, identifying Krishna in different ways. Because many people are Krishna, so which particular Krishna, which particular Krishna is she identifying with? She's identifying with that Krishna who's the son of Vasudev. Now, some people, they think of Vasudev as being the all-pervading. So yes, Krishna is all-pervading. He's everywhere. He's in everything. He's in every atom. He's in the hearts of all living entities. So that is Krishna also. Krishna, he is also Vasudeva. And he is also the son of Vasudeva. His parents were Vasudev and Devaki when he appeared in Mathura. And then Lord Krishna is also described as the pleasure of Devaki, the mother. She is the one who gave birth to Lord Krishna. He appears from the womb of Devaki. Devaki and Vasudev were both in the prison house of Kamsa. And the Srimad Bhagavatam describes how Devaki had a brilliant effulgence when the Lord was within her womb. Even Kamsa could understand, oh, this is some very special personality who's coming from my sister. Of course, Devaki is the sister of Kamsa. But Kamsa had put his sister along with her husband into his prison. So this Krishna is the one who gives pleasure to Devaki and is also described as Nandagopa Komaraya. He's also related to Nanda Maharaj and the cowherd men of Vrindavan. Because Lord Krishna, from his very birth, it was arranged that Vasudev would bring Lord Krishna over to Goku, across the Yamuna, to change the baby. Lord Krishna took the form. First of all, he appeared in the prison in Mathura in the forearm form as Narayan to convince Vasudev and Devaki that he was the Lord and he was coming as their son. So they requested him please take the form of a baby because if everyone sees us with a child, if they think we have a child with four arms, they'll think it's very strange. You know, you wouldn't like to take your child around if he has four arms, you know. I mean, <laughs> unless you're very, very much an inhabitant of Vaikuntha. In Vaikuntha, everyone has four arms, but it's, we don't see people with four arms here in this world. So Lord Krishna was appearing in this bhumi, this, on this planet, and uh, Vasudev and Devaki requested him, please take a form as a baby. And so the Lord assumed a form as a little baby. Vasudev then took him out across the Yamuna to Nanda Maharaji's home and took the baby girl who Mother Yashoda had given birth to and left the baby boy there for Nanda Maharaj. So Lord Krishna was brought up in Vrindavan with the Brijbasi people because he loves to be with all the cows and the people of Vrindavan. They're all very dear to him. They're his very, very dear devotees. So Lord Krishna, from the moment of his birth, he said, take me there to Vrindavan. I want to be in Braja with all the bridge Basi people and with all the cows. Because Krishna is also Govindaya Namonama. He's also known as Govinda, one who gives pleasure 
to the cows and to the senses. So Lord Krishna has that position. He's very fond of cows and he's also fond of the Brahminical culture. And the Brahminical culture, not just the, the birth, one who's born as a Brahmana, but the Brahminical culture means people who are actually devoted to the Supreme Lord. In other words, Vaishnava, the Brahman position of a Brahman, that is a material designation. And it's not something which is just acquired by birth. The birthright al alone does not qualify one as a Brahman. You have to develop the qualities of the Brahmins. And that, that is described in the Bhagavad Gita. All the qualities which are expected to be seen in a Brahman. Samodamastapasocham shantir arjavam evacha jnana vijnana astikyam brahma karma svabhavajam Lord Krishna describes nine qualities which are visible in the brahmanas. So Lord Krishna uh, was very dear to the cows and the brahmanas. Here talks about the cows and the senses. The senses, our senses are actually meant for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. We're meant to use them in the service of Krishna. We'll be talking more about that this evening also. Because Lord Krishna is the proprietor of everything. So our senses are also his property. And we're meant to use them in his service. As said here, he's the enlivener of the cows and the senses. The cows are very happy when Lord Krishna is there. When Lord Krishna would call them, the cows would come running and they would give milk in abundance. The, of course, in, in Lord Krishna's cows, cows are all Kamadenu cows. They're wish fulfilling, they fulfill everything, they give everything, unlimited quantities of milk. In Vrindavan, the cows are all Kamadenu cows. The trees are Kalpa Briksha. And every speck of dust is Chintamani. But the people of Vrindavan, the, the actual inhabitants of Vrindavan, are so pure that although the cows and the trees can give everything they want, the people of Vrindavan simply want some flowers and fruit from the trees and some milk from the cows. And they use these things to offer to Lord Krishna. They don't want anything for their sense gratification. They're satisfied to have flowers and fruit and milk. And in this way they can perfectly worship Lord Sri Krishna. So Lord Krishna is known in this way by Kunti. She's identifying Lord Krishna, the son of Vasudev, the one who gives pleasure to Devaki, and the one who is also the, uh, very dear to the Nanda Maharaj and the cowherd men, the Gopas of Vrindavan. Nanda Maharaj was like the foster father of Lord Krishna. Although Lord Krishna came from Vasudeva and Devaki, his, his childhood was there in Vrindavan with Nanda and Yashoda. They were his foster parents. Lord Krishna was enjoying with them. Actually, the Shastras tell us that whenever Lord Krishna comes, it's always Nanda and Yashoda who are his mother and father. Vasudev and Devaki, they could give birth to Krishna, but they could not enjoy the childhood Leela of Krishna. The childhood Leela of Krishna is very, very special. And that is only for 
Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. Mother Yashoda is such a great devotee, even demigods like Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, they're nowhere near equal to the level of Mother Yashoda, who is such a great devotee that she can perform her Damodar Leela. She can cr chase Krishna and she can even tie up Krishna. She can bind him up. So this is the exalted position of devotees like Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj. He can chastise Krishna. Even the people of Vrindavan, they would tell Nanda Maharaj, we think your son may be some great demigod. He may even be an incarnation of Narayan because he's killed so many demons who have been coming to Vrindavan. We don't know his identity. But Nanda Maharaj says to the people, Oh, come on. You don't know my son. I will tell you about my son. Don't you know all the mischief he, di he gives? All the trouble he does stealing the butter and feeding it to the monkeys? And sometimes he will pass urine here and there. You, you th and you think my son is an incarnation? You think he's an... You don't know who is my son. So Nanda Maharaj, he can only see Krishna in that way because he has that Vatsalya Ras. Ma Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, they only see Krishna as their child. And when other people try to tell them that he could be God, they say, oh, please, come on, don't, you're wrong, you're so wrong, you don't know our son. So this is the wonder of Lord Krishna, that he is enjoying his wonderful relationship with these devotees. So Queen Kunti is ap appreciating Lord Krishna as being more merciful than Lord Rama. Lord Rama is always the king's son, or he's the, the ruler of Ayodhya. So everyone will worship him and approach him with awe and veneration. But Lord Krishna is approached with great intimacy and loving feeling. So Queen Kunti says Krishna is even more merciful. All right, we'll go on to text number 22. Here you can see the next verse. You can chant. Nama Pankajana Bhaya. Nama Pankajamalane. Nama Pankajanetraya. Namaste Pankajangraye. Translation. My respectful obeisances are unto you, O Lord, whose abdomen is marked with a depression like a lotus flower, who are always decorated with garlands of lotus flowers, whose glance is as cool as the lotus, and whose feet are engraved with lotuses. So, Queen Kunti is identifying Lord Krishna by some specific characteristic markings which are seen on the Lord. Just like in Vaikuntha, Sanatan Goswami has written one book called Brihad Bhagavad Amrita and he describes about how a cowherd boy from Govardhan was given a mantra by his guru and by the power of the guru's mantra he was able to go to many different places in the universe and then he went outside of the universe and he even entered into Vaikuntha but when he got into Vaikuntha he, was, he, he met someone with four arms and he thought he must be the Lord of Vaikuntha and he offered obeisances to him and he began to praise him as the Supreme Lord. 
But the person said, oh no, please stop it. No, please don't say like that. I'm not the Lord. I'm not the He, this person had achieved Swarupa Mukti. There are different kinds of liberation. So one of the liberations is to have the same bodily features as the Lord. So Gop Kumar, this cowherd boy from Govardhan, he got into Vaikuntha and he kept on meeting people who they were very effulgent, very beautiful, very handsome, and they had four arms. And he thought they were the Lord of the universe. But they would all say, no, 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 please, no, we're not. And then finally someone explained to him that everyone in Vaikuntha, they all have four arm forms. They have achieved that Swarupa Mukti. They have the same bodily feature, but there's two special characteristics which distinguish the Supreme Lord from the other inhabitants of Vaikuntha. So one of them is that the Lord of Vaikuntha, he wears around his neck a kastuba necklace, a very spe special kastuba necklace, and he also has a special mark on his chest which is mark of Srivatsa, which is a mark on his chest. And only the Supreme Lord has these two features. And this is what distinguishes him from the other inhabitants of Vaikuntha. So uh, here, Queen Kunti is describing some different features of Lord Krishna. First of all, she says, Nama Pankajanabaya said, Your abdomen is marked with a depression like a lotus flower. Of course, Queen Kunti is talking about Garbhodakeshai Vishnu. There are three Purush avatars. First of all, there is Karanadakeshai Vishnu, or he is sometimes known as Mahavishnu. Now Mahavishnu, he lays down on the causal ocean. And while he's laying on the causal ocean, when he exhales, universes come out of his body. Just like little spears, they're like small, just like perspiration comes out from our own body. When we're sweating, we perspire a lot, water comes out. So. In the same way, universes come out as small spherical drops and then they expand into universes. They all come from the body of Karana Dakashai Vishnu or Mahavishnu. And then Mahavishnu expands into each universe and that expansion is Garbo Dakashai Vishnu. And he goes into each universe and then from his own body, perspiration comes, which makes an ocean in the bottom half of the universe. That is called the Garbodak Ocean. And then Gar Garbodak Shai Vishnu, he can lay down on that Garbodak Ocean, which is at the bottom of the universe. Actually, it fills up half of the universe. So Garbhadakshayi Vishnu is laying there on that water and from his navel comes the lotus flower. And from that lotus flower, Lord Brahma takes his birth. So try to understand how the whole universal creation comes about from a lotus flower. <laughs> it's un inconceivable that th this lotus flower coming from the navel of Garbhodakshayi Vishnu, expands, Lord Brahma takes his birth, and then Lord Brahma begins the secondary part of creation. The primary part of creation is done by Vishnu. He creates the different elements, but it is Brahma who does the secondary creation. He will design the bodies, he will arrange the planets in different positions in the universe, and it, they all come from the lotus flower, and they're all situated around this lotus flower. 
So the lotus flower is something very special. So the Lord's abdomen is marked with the depression of a lotus flower. And the Lord is always decorated with a garland of lotus flowers. The Lord likes to have a garland of lotus flowers. Uh, I, w I was visiting temples in Europe just before I came here. And I, I was surprised to see how few flowers they have there. <laughs> they're very short of flowers. They, they say they're just so expensive. It's so difficult for them to get flowers. I think it must also be quite expensive here. But still, we are managing to have some flowers. So, of course, flowers are an, an important part of deity worship. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushvam, that we can offer a leaf, a flower, a fruit, water. And the lotus flower is some fl a flower which is very sacred to Lord Krishna. He's very, very fond of the lotus flower. The f lotus flower is considered the most beautiful of all flowers. And different parts of the body of Lord Krishna are described to be like lotus, like the lotus, just like his lotus face. And we will hear also how he has lotus eyes, he has lotus hands, his navel is like a lotus, his feet are also lotus, like lotus, his lotus feet, his lotus lips, different parts of his body are compared to the lotus flower, because the lotus is so beautiful. So whenever we see the lotus flower, we're encouraged to remember Lord Krishna, right? The, we want to train our mind to remember Krishna. The scriptures tell us, smartavyam satatam vishnu vishmartavya najatukrit. Sarve vidi nisirashur eta yor eva kinkara. The most important of all regulative principles is always remember Krishna and never forget him. This is the most important. And we have to do that. We have to train our mind to remember Krishna. Queen Kunti is showing us how by seeing the lotus flower, then we can remember Krishna and we can awaken our love for Krishna just by seeing the lotus flower. And we will think of Lord Krishna's lotus face, his lotus feet, his lotus hands, everything about Lord Krishna, different parts of his body are compared to the lotus flower. Srila Prabhupada, when he was talking on this verse, he described how in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna had also given Arjuna some different ways in which people could remember him. And we see, for example, in Bhagavad Gita, Vibhuti Yoga, Lord Krishna is describing his vibhutis how he is present in so many different ways, so that common people can think of the Lord at every moment. Uh, Prabhupada takes a verse, Rasoham Apsukontia. Lord Krishna says, I am the taste in water. Well, the word is not necessarily water, it says, I am the taste in liquid, actually. Rasoham apsukontia. It's not, it's not specifically water which is mentioned, but any substance which is liquid, it has a taste. And that taste can help us to remember Krishna. Uh, when Srila Prabhupada was in Indonesia, in Jakarta, it's recorded 
how he met this one man, it was an Indian man living in Jakarta. And so the man was saying to Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, I like Krishna, but I also like alcohol. <laughs> and so Srila Prabhupada quoted this verse, Rasoham of Sukhuntiya. He said, when you're drinking your alcohol, you just simply have to remember Lord Krishna. That that taste of the alcohol, that is Krishna. And if you th go on thinking like that, then one day you will also develop pure love for Krishna. And so this, Srila Prabhupada was encouraging this man in this way. He, di he didn't say, you, you have to stop drinking, this is maya. Of course, it is maya. But Srila Prabhupada was telling him, all right, you have this bad habit, but if you will take it the right way, you use it, you understand this is not such a good thing, this is an intoxication, then you can think of Krishna, understand Krishna is this taste, that what I'm actually attracted to, it's not the alcohol, it's not the liquor which is attracting us. What we're actually attracted by is the taste, and that taste is Krishna. We want to taste Krishna, and we, everything, and Krishna is there in everything. He is the active principle in everything. We just simply have to understand things in the proper way. And in this way we can become God conscious. So it's very important for us to try to apply this kind of thinking. This is meditation, right? We have to me meditation means to fix the mind on the Lord. Not to think of nothing. Of course some people think Meditation is to make the mind blank. Other people think that we have to make them fix the mind on the, the light, on the oneness. But rather, the devotees meditate on the Lord and his transcendental form. And he has special beauty. And we can see that beauty for common people. The Lord comes in the form of Archamurti, in the form of the deity. And when we worship the deity, then we can actually see the beauty of the Lord. Just like tonight, we see the deities, very beautiful. Beautiful dress, and they're nicely decorated, and they look very pleasing and charming decorated with a garland of flowers and beautiful jewelry. So we come and we see the deities and we see the beauty of Lord Krishna. And seeing the beauty of Krishna, we forget all the troubles, all the miseries of the material existence. So the temple is like that. It is meant to be an an oasis in the desert. We come out of the desert of material existence and we come into the transcendental realm where Lord Krishna is residing with all of his eternal associates. We see Lord Krishna with Srimati Radharani. Then we see Lord Krishna with Lord Balaram. And then we see the Lord is there with his brother and sister, Baladev and Subhadra. And then we see him in his most merciful form when he comes as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with Lord Nityananda. And then we see his other incarnation as Lord Narsimha, who is the protector of the devotees. So we come to the temple and we forget all the struggles of material existence and we fix our mind on the transcendental form of the Lord. So this way meditation is made very easy for us. Seeing the deity and chanting the holy name. 
by chanting the holy name, then we are also directly connecting with the Lord. So the process of Krishna consciousness is very easy if we will follow the process. We just have to follow as we are as we're being instructed by the spiritual teachers, Srila Prabhupada, in the line of disciplic succession. They're giving us these instructions. If we follow them, then certainly we can become God conscious. We can remember Him at every moment. How to remember Him? Well, by chanting, just by coming, seeing the deity, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to hear, just like we're speaking every evening here, we're speaking from Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to hear Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Some people think, oh, Bhagavat Sapta, seven days, that's enough. No. Srimad Bhagavatam says, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. You have to hear the Bhagavatam regularly, constantly. Nitya means every day or even 24 hours a day. We have to hear continually this message of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana. Simply by hearing, you get pious activities. And that piety is necessary for us to remember Krishna and to take up bhakti yoga. That, that gives us the qualification to practice bhakti yoga. Srila Prabhupada was asked, how do we know if we're making advancement? And Srila Prabhupada explained, he said, he said, just like if you eat food, if you come and you're hungry, you have not eaten, then you come and you begin to eat your food. Then you feel relief from hunger, you feel nourishment, and you feel satisfaction. These three things all come simultaneously, bite by bite. Hmm? Nobody else knows if we're getting relief from hunger. We know ourselves. We know ourselves. When you're satisfied, when you're, you no longer feel hungry, you feel satisfaction, you feel nourishment. So. The Srimad Bhagavatam compares the, this eating process to making advancement in spiritual life. It's just like when we are worshipping Krishna and chanting the holy name, we should feel detachment from the material things. We're less concerned with the mundane world. We will feel also devotion for the Lord. And one day we will also have direct perception of the Lord. We will actually see Krishna. We will, when we see the deity, we will not just simply think, oh, a statue. We will think, the Lord himself has come. The Lord has appeared in his deity form. And when we chant the holy name, we will know Krishna is there. It's Krishna coming as his holy name. The direct perception of Krishna is there. So in this way we will know how we're progressing in spiritual life by these three things. It's just like eating. Srila Prabhupada explains about this verse. He said, Panka means mud and Ja means to generate. So Pankaja, the lotus flower, is so important. Still, it is generated from mud. So Krishna likes Pankaja very much. Lotus flower. So if we see lotus flower, we can immediately remember Krishna. Right? We should think like this. 
Kunti Devi, a great devotee, is giving us opportunity to become Krishna conscious. Simply concentrating your mind on lotus flower. That's all. As soon as you see a lotus flower, you will immediately think of Nama Pankaja Nabaya. Oh, Krishna's navel is just like lotus flower. So Queen Kunti is teaching all of us how we can remember Krishna. Right? The mo most important business is to fix the mind on Krishna. In this relation, there is the example of Maharaj Ambarish, how he was a great devotee, and he practiced devotional service, engaging all of his senses in Krishna's service, using his legs to go to the temple and to dance in the kirtan, using his hands to clean the temple, using his tongue to chant the names of the Lord and to taste the prasadam, using his nose to smell the flowers offered to the deity and his eyes to see the beauty of the deity and using his uh, ears to hear the glories of the Lord from the devotees, Even using all of his different senses for the service of Lord Krishna. But Srimad Bhagavatam says the very first thing he did was Savaimana Krishna Padaravinda Yor. And then after then Savaimana Krishna Padaravinda Yor Vachamsi Vaikuntha Gunarnavarnane Kaloha Kaloharir Madir Marjanadishu Shutanakod Satkatoda Ye like that. Uh, the, the point is, Savaimana Krishna Padara Vindaya, the Ambarish Maharaj fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. That's the very first business to do. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita also, Lord Krishna is instructing Arjuna. He says to Arjuna, first of all think of me and then perform your duty and go and fight. He doesn't say, do your duty and then come back and then think of me. First of all, you think of me in the form of Krishna and th then go and do your duty. So our very first business is to control the mind. Srila Prabhupada used to quote his own spiritual teacher, Om Vishnupad, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. He, he, he said his Guru Maharaj used to say, every morning, you have to take shoes and beat the mind. And every evening, before you take rest, you have to take a stick and beat, beat the mind. Why? To bring them, uh, the point is, make, bring the mind to think of Krishna. Because the mind is rebellious. From the Bhagavad Gita, we know the mind can be the friend, the mind can be the enemy. It's how we use everything. Are you going to use your mind to think of Krishna and to elevate yourself? Or are you going to use the mind to think of Maya and degrade yourself? So very important that we train our mind to think of Krishna. So Queen Kunti, she's a great devotee. Her mind is trained. She's thinking the lotus flower, and she's showing us how lotus flowers can help us to remember Krishna at every moment. We have to train the mind. How to beat the mind? Sometimes people wonder, how to beat the mind? How do you do that? What you have to do, you get the mind to do what it doesn't want to do. Right? The mind doesn't want to wake up in the morning and go to Mongol Arti. The mind doesn't want to get up in the morning and chant the holy name. The mind said, oh no, sleep, take more rest, You're, you need more sleep. 
The mind will say so many things. The mind will say, say don't surrender to Krishna. Ma the mind will say, well, you chanted yesterday. Why do you need to chant today? You need a day off, you know. The mind will say so many things. We have to train the mind. The mind is rebellious. And we have to discipline it. And how do you train it? And sometimes it's compared to a wild animal sometimes. How do you train a wild animal? Did you ever train a lion or a tiger? You capture it, you put it in the cage, and then you don't feed it. You starve it. You let it go hungry for many days. So the beast is very hungry. And then you have to beat it. And after you've beaten it, then you feed it. So in this way the animal understands. They think, this man is very powerful. He put me in the cage, he beat me, and now he's feeding me. I better do what he says. So the same way we have to do like that with our mind. You have to beat the mind. You make it do what it doesn't want to do. The mind, due to our contamination, doesn't want to hear about Krishna. We make it go and hear about Krishna. The mind doesn't want to chant. You chant. The mind doesn't want to serve Krishna. You make it serve Krishna. And you starve the mind. You don't give it any sense gratification. You don't give in to the desires of the material world. You have to starve it. And then you feed it. You give it Krishna consciousness. You let it have Krishna prasadam. We don't eat the garbage food. We eat prasadam. Like this, we have to train our mind to think of Krishna. So this is the important point given here in this verse. How to remember Krishna. Okay, we'll, we'll go on to the next verse. Let's see. Just a minute. Uh, um, okay. Here we are. Okay, so this is text number 23 in the verse. Yatari shikesha kalena devaki Kamsena rudati charam sucharpita Vimochita ham cha sahatma javibo Trayeva nate na mohor vipadganat. Queen Kunti is praying, O Rishi Kesha, Master of the Senses and Lord of Lords, you have re released your mother Devaki, who was long imprisoned and distressed by the envious King Kamsa and me and my children from a series of constant dangers. So, Queen Kunti is addressing Lord Krishna as Rishi Kesha, master of the senses. Rishi meaning the senses, and Ekesha, the master. So, there is one master, Ekala Ishwara Krishna or Sabhridya. 
Lord Krishna alone is the master. All others are his servants. So everything which we have, it is actually Lord Krishna's property. When we study the Bhagavad Gita, we read there in the fifth chapter, the peace formula. Bhogdaram yagna tapasham. Right. So everything is the property of Krishna. Right? He is Maheshwar. He is the proprietor. Everything belongs to him. It's all meant for his pleasure. Our body also, it is, we say our body, it's not really ours. It's given to us by the grace of Krishna. And it will be taken from us also in course of time. And with the body, there are also senses. So these senses are also given to us by the Lord. They're not actually ours. We say, my hand, we say, my eyes, my tongue. They, these things are all given to us by Lord Krishna himself. He is the proprietor. And he gives us these things. Just like sometimes we may become paralyzed. Just now you're using your hands, but at any moment you can lose the power. You can lose the power to walk. You can lose the, pl the power to lift your hands. That power can be taken away from us because this body is not ours. It's given to us. And we're given that body according to our past activities, according to our qualification. We're given a particular type of body. Just like somebody may think, I want to eat stool. You know, you'd have to be, you know, it's not a normal human being who would want to eat stool. But when some, when some living entity thinks like that, that I want to eat stew, then they're given the body of a pig. You don't need the human body. You take the body of a pig. And they live in the pig body. So this is what happens. The body, this body is a manifestation of our karma from our past activities. And we're... In the field of karma, now, the, the work which we do, the activities which we perform in this life, it will determine our future body. We are sowing the seeds of the future body by the work and the activities which we do now in this life. It will determine what kind of body we will take in the future. Just like now we have the human body, so we're superior to the animals, you know, the dogs and the cats and the different living entities which are running around here on four legs. We're superior to them. But at the same time, there are living entities superior to us. There are demigods or devas the residents of the higher planets, and they are superior to all of us. And we are directed and controlled by them. We are also influenced by them. And of course, above the demigods, there is the one Supreme Lord. So, we want to understand the nature of this material world that Lord Krishna is actually the master of the senses. And he is the Lord of all lords. There are many different lords. There's a, Indra is also Lord, different uh, Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma. Who is the supreme Lord above all of them? Of course, that we say the supreme Lord is ultimately Lord Sri Krishna.
just like Brigham Muni was enlisted by the demigods to go and find out who is supreme among Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And Brigham Muni went to Lord Brahma first of all. Now Brigham Muni is one of the sons of Brahma. And when he went to see Lord Brahma, he did not offer respect to him. So Lord Brahma thought, he is my son and he's not giving me any respect. He was just disrespect. He didn't show any interest in his father. So Brahma was not pleased. He thought, what kind of son is this? And Brigo could see that Brahma was disturbed. Although Lord Brahma didn't do anything, he didn't take any action against Brigo, but he was not pleased to meet with Brigo because Brigo did not give him any respect. So then Brigo went to Kailash to see Lord Shiva. And when Lord Shiva saw him coming, Lord Shiva was thinking, Oh, Brigo, it's my brother, because Lord Shiva was also, he's also one of the sons of Brahma. He had come into this world as one of the sons of Brahma. So he came to embrace Brigo Muni. But Brigo Muni saw him coming and said, Oh, don't you touch me. No, no, don't you touch me. Look, your body's all ashes and you've got these snakes on your body. I don't want to be touched by you. You're all contaminated. Don't come near me. So Lord Shiva, he is Asutosh. He can be easily pleased but he can also be easily angered. And when he heard Brigo Muni speak like that, he became angry and he was ready to kill. He said, where's my tree shoe? Let me get my tree shoe. I'll kill this man. And Mother Parvati had to come quickly and she embraced Lord Shiva and said, no, no, he's your brother. She told Brigo, get out of here. You better go quick, save your life. So Brigo Muni had to leave there. Then he went to Sweda Dweep. And he went to see in Sweda Dweep, Lord Vishnu was lying there. And he was lying on his serpent bed of Anantashesha. And Lakshmi was there massaging his lotus feet. So, Brigu Muni came in and he kicked Lord Vishnu on the chest. He just kicked him. And what did Lord Vishnu do? He got up and said, Oh, my dear Brigham Muni, I hope you did not hurt your foot on my hard chest. Right? So the, the, this, this was shocking to Brigham Muni because he committed the greatest offense against Lord Vishnu. But Lord Vishnu was so tolerant. He said, Oh, I hope you did not hurt your foot on my hard chest. So Brigham Muni came back and he told all the sages who was actually the supreme. So we say, Aradhanam Sarvesham Vishnor Aradhanam Param. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is the supreme. And the worship of Vishnu means also worship of Lord Krishna. It is Lord Krishna who is the origin of Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is Parusha Avatar. But the Parusha Avatars, they are coming from Govinda, the original Swayam Bhagavan, Lord Sri Krishna, Anadir Adir Govinda, Sarva Karana Karanam, the cause of all causes and the origin of everything. So this is Lord Krishna's supreme position. So it is Lord Krishna who is the master of everything and the Lord of Lords. And this was appreciated by Queen Kunti. And Queen Kunti said, you've delivered your mother, Devaki, who was long imprisoned. As we explained, Vasudev and Devaki, Lord Krishna's own mother and father, they were in the prison house of Kamsa. It happened that at the time of the marriage of Devaki, there was an omen from the sky Kamsa was driving the chariot and he was taking Vasudev and Devaki just after their marriage. He was taking them to their home. And the, an omen from the sky said, Oh Kamsa, you're such a fool. The eighth child of your sister will kill you. So immediately Kamsa became enraged and he grabbed his knife and he took his sister by the hair and he was going to, he was going to kill her. But Vasudev was an expert p 
politician. He was not a Maharati. He was a Kshatriya, but he was not a Maharati, but he was a politician. Politician means good talker, right? He was a good talker, and he spoke to Kamsa, and he told Kamsa, he said, you know, it will not be very good for your reputation if you kill your sister. She's just a young girl, and it's on the day of her marriage, and you want to kill her? He said, this will be a very bad thing to do. And, and Vasudev went on, and he convinced Kamsa. He said, I promise you, he said, you're not in any danger from your sister. Your sister's not going to kill you. It's the eighth child of your sister who was supposed to kill you. So I promise you that if we have children, whatever children we have, I will deliver them to you. And so Kamsa trusted the integrity of Vasudev. Vasudev was a respected person. And although Kamsa was a demon, but he respected the integrity of Vasudev. And he took him at his word. And he said, all right, yes, I will spare my sister. But when you give birth, your children, you give them to me. And Kamsa, uh, Vasudev was thinking, at least for, let me save the situation at the present. Later on, we'll figure out what to do. And so, of course, it happened that Vasudev and Devaki, they gave birth. And of course, Narada Muni also came by and he instigated Kamsa that get Vasudev and Devaki, you should put them in prison, you should keep them in prison because uh, you don't know you're in danger. No, it wasn't Narada Muni, it was the other demons, you know, all the Kamsa's friends. They told him, they said, this is very dangerous, that this Vasudev and Devaki that they're going to have the eighth child going to kill you. You better keep them in your prison. Don't let them just want go away. You may never find them. So Kamsa had them arrested and he kept them in the prison house. And then one after another, when Devaki gave birth, Kamsa killed the children. Vasudev kept his word. He, he, he thought, well, we've given birth. I promised Kamsa that I would give the... He delivered the children to Kamsa, and Kamsa killed them one after another. Six children were killed. The seventh child, of course, was Lord Balaram. And Lord Balaram was transferred. Everyone thought Devaki had a miscarriage. But actually, it was the arrangement of Purnamasi that she transferred... The seventh child, who was Lord Balaram, she transferred him to the womb of Rohini, who was over in Goku, in the home of Nanda Maharaj. So Krishna and Balaram are actually brothers, although Balaram took birth from Rohini. But actually, originally, they were brothers. So the seventh child was Lord Balaram, and then the eighth child, Lord Krishna. So when Vas Devaki gave birth to the eighth child, somehow Lord Krishna was born at midnight and everyone was asleep. And by the arrangement of the Supreme Lord, all the doors opened and Vasudev could go out of the prison and he could go across the Yamuna to Goku to the home of Nanda Maharaj, take the baby girl, leave the baby boy. And he brought the baby girl back to Mathura. And that next morning, Kamsa came and he heard that Devaki had given birth. He came running, the eighth child is born, the one is going to kill me. And he took, they said, no, it's a girl, it's not a boy. He took the child and he tried to throw on the ground, but the child rose up in the air and revealed the divine form of Mother Durga, one of the forms of Durga. So Kamsa, it was a a shocking experience for him that he saw the divine form of you know the goddess Durga and so he became a little humble and he <laughs> thought what to do so this this is the pastime uh, Lord Krishna of course was brought to Mathura and he had to fight with Kamsa Akrura has his famous journey going to Vrindavan and bringing 
Krishna and Balaram from Vrindavan to Mathura and Lord Krishna has to go in the arena with Balaram and they have to fight big wrestlers Ch Chanura and Mustika very big powerful wrestlers Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram are fighting them and and they fought them and killed them and then Kamsa came with his sword and he wanted to kill Krishna so Lord Krishna had to deal a death blow to Kamsa and he killed Kamsa and when he killed Kamsa then he could release Vasudeva and Devaki from the prison house and so in this way Devaki was released by the grace of Lord Krishna and this is being appreciated by Kunti now the interesting point is however that Kunti's sons they were saved they didn't die but Devaki's sons all died why? One reason Prabhupada explained, he said, Devaki had her husband. She had a husband with her, Vasudeva. Kunti did not have any husband. Her husband was Pandu, and Pandu had died. He left the world. At that time, the co-wife Madri had also departed, and Kunti was taking care of all the children by herself. So Lord Krishna protected the children of Kunti but he didn't protect the children of Devaki. Of course, later on, there's another pastime. After, <laughs> after Lord Krishna w released Devaki from the prison, there's another pastime how uh, Lord Krishna had brought back his guru's son from death. So Devaki said, you brought back your guru's son from death, can you bring back your brothers? Your brothers have also died. Can you bring them back? And so Lord Krishna went with Lord Balaram. They went and they went to Yamalok and they found the six children and they brought them all back to Devaki. And Devaki fed her breast milk to them and then they all went to the heavenly planets because they were actually demigods who had been cursed that they would take birth in the womb of Devaki. All right, so... <laughs> So many things to talk about. There's only limited time. Nine o'clock. Is there any question? Yes, Prabhu? We have the microphone. Anybody there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Panam. Maharaj, with your permission, I'll make one comment and one ask one question, Maharaj. Yes. The comment is, Maharaj, um, your purity is so much relishing. And the what Sister Staka said, Anandam Buddhi Vardhanam Prati Pradam. So the every day when we are listening to your katha, Maharaj, that joy is increasing so much that if your katha goes on the whole night, I believe we will still be relishing. Thank you, Maharaj, for <laughs> for giving us this uh, series of lectures. Maharaj, my question is that uh, we always, when we talk about our senses, we always are in a, at least in trial mode, to try to dovetail our senses to the pleasure of Krishna. Now today you told one sentence which is very hopeful, giving a lot of hope, where you said that Lord Krishna is the enlivener of cows and senses. So he, el he, he enlivens the senses. So on one hand, there is an effort from our side to dovetail the senses, pleasure of senses to Krishna. On the other hand, Krishna enlivens it. So which one precedes? So Krishna if enlivens the senses, it, the process could be much easier for us. Why that is not happening, Maharaj? In our case, I mean to say. Well, Hare Krishna Krish says, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So it's a reciprocation. Krishna is bhakta vatsala, right? He reciprocates with the bhakti. So where he sees bhakti, then he will reciprocate with that devotee. And we'll feel that enliven, enlivening nature will come by the grace of Krishna. We will become enlivened by Krishna's mercy. The more we have, have the mood to want to please Krishna, to serve Krishna, then Krishna will give us that transcendental pleasure. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj Dhanad Pranam. 
Maharaj, you mentioned that after uh, uh, Vasudhya took Krishna to Gokul, and then uh, uh, he brought the girls by, back to, uh, to prison, and Kamsa knew that she became Durga. So she, uh, Kamsa knew very well the boy has already gone. So uh, uh, how, how did he manage to keep himself quiet, not harming uh, Vasudhya and Devaki for so many years? Kamsa didn't know. He didn't know a boy was born. He didn't know. He didn't know. No. The, when when the, when Devaki delivered, then the, 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 the Kamsa came the next morning only and thought, it's a girl. They said, no, it's a girl, it's not a boy. But still he wanted to kill it. But he didn't know it was a boy. He didn't know that. Only found out, he found out later on. They told him that, that Vasudev tricked you. <laughs> then became very angry. He wanted to kill Vasudev. That was when Krishna took action to kill him. But when, but when uh, Kansa sent Putana to kill all the babies in uh, uh, Gogol, that time I'm sure that uh, uh, Kamsa knew about it by then or he didn't know? Didn't know. Didn't know. No, no. Didn't know. These different, the different demons. We hear that they were friends of Kamsa, but he, he didn't know what was happening. He, was, he, t he sent agents to kill all the children born and around there. But the only people he could kill were the, were, were the, the, the children of the demons, the children of Kamsa's army, you know. They were all killed. The devotee children were all protected. But Kamsa didn't know. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj here. here. Oh, okay. Maharaj, uh, one common trait we see in all the demons like Ravana or uh, Kamsa is that they are on a suicidal mission actually. You know, even Kamsa after seeing Mother Durga, at least at that time point of time he could have understood his precarious situation and he could have made a turnaround. But why they are uh, hell-bent on destroying themselves? Uh, you know, uh, this is my doubt actually. Even, even Kamsa and Ravana also. So many advice was given, but still he was uh, very adamant that he should uh, fight and... Uh, what, what, I didn't hear everything clearly. Maharaj, I will repeat again, Maharaj. Uh, one common trait we see in all the demons like Ravana or Kamsa, is that they never ever try to, you know, make a turnaround in their position. Like when even after seeing Mother Durga, Kamsa at that point of time he could have realized that it's a futile uh, uh, battle and he could have, you know, saved himself. But why they don't do that? Why they don't surrender yeah. and worship the de worship like that? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the demonic nature, right? That to make that there, there's a d demonic nature. They don't want to surrender. They don't want to accept that, even though they see, even though they see these different forms of the Lord. They have these different experiences. They will dismiss it. They will not recognize it as, and they think, no, it was just a chance. So. They won't take it as anything significant. They'll try to ignore it and to neglect it because they're demons. What, they have that nature, they have this from their past, that they have that nature to neglect and to be disobedient to the Lord and not to accept authority, to be always rebellious because they want to control separate from the demigods, separate from the devas and the supreme lord. They're thinking, what is the demonic nature? The demon thinks, Ishwaraham, I am the controller. Ahambogi, I am the enjoyer. Siddoham, Balavam Suki, I am perfect, I am strong, I am happy. This is the demonic nature. They, they, they think like that. They cannot think that, oh, I should surrender, I should be a devotee, I should worship. No. And if they do worship, of course, demons like Ravana and so on, they worship 
Lord Brahma or they worship Lord Shiva to get some material blessing. They want to kill others. Like Haranyakashipu, he wanted to live forever. And so if they do worship someone, they do it for material purposes, to get some blessings that they can enjoy the material sense gratification. So this, this is the de demonic nature. To change the demons, to make them into devotees, it's not so easy job. That we're trying every day when our devotees are going preaching, book distribution. We try to bring the de make the demons into devotees. It takes time. It takes mercy. The mercy of Krishna. They need to get the mercy of Krishna. How to get that mercy? They have to have a change in heart. But their hearts are very hard, very cold. They don't have feelings. They don't have care for others. They're very selfish. They only think of their own self. So that mentality is there in the demon. And to change that mentality, you need a lot of mercy. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So Maharaj, you have a question? Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for such a wonderful class. Um, Maharaj, uh, you were talking about Devaki's children getting killed by Kamsa. Now, uh, if the karma of the children was to die and Kamsa becomes an instrument, how is Kamsa being blamed for that act then, Maharaj? <laughs> well, yes. Karma of the children was to die, but how they could die, there are other ways they could die, you see. Not that somebody has to come and kill them. They could die other ways. If the Lord wants them to die other ways, he can arrange that. But Kamsa had to reveal his demonic nature by killing them. Yeah, they could have died other ways, but the Lord wanted Kamsa should do it. That was a curse, actually, that they would be killed by Kamsa. The, those children in their previous life, they were, they had worshipped Haranyakashipu, right? And then they had worshipped, oh, they were, they, were, they were the children of Haranyakashipu, and they worshipped Lord Brahma without going through their father. So Haranyakashipu cursed them that next life they will take birth in the womb of Devaki and be killed by their father. Because Kamsa was in previous life, he was Purna, he was uh, uh, Kalanimi, yes, Kalanimi, right. So he was Kalanimi, so he was related to, Kam he was related to Haranyakashipu, he was one of the sons. So he was like that, so it was arranged like that. It had to happen. Yeah, they could have died other ways, but you can't say, well, it's their karma. So if, if it's karma, still there's karma. It's Kam Kamsa's karma also, that he had to kill them and he had to suffer for killing them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. So we will thank Maharaj by chanting one time Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So tomorrow 5 a.m. there will be Mangala Arati, 7 a.m. Sringara Arati, 7.45 Gopal class by Bhaktin Riddhi. Topic of uh, Gopal class is pastime of Lord Jagannath. And 8 a.m. we will have class by His Holiness